Good morning. morning. And welcome everybody to our worship service this morning. Everyone looks all rested. Get that extra hour of sleep. Um, I've been up since 4 a.m. and I could not shake the feeling this whole time that I was going to be late. I was about an hour late for church and that, but it's, it's great to be here and for all of you to be here as well. What's more important for us today is this is All Saints Day observed the first Sunday um, after November 1st. Um, And as we worship together, we do want to take time to remember those saints who have passed before us, especially those from our congregation who have passed in this past year. And we'll remember them especially in our prayers. And so it's with those things in mind, we'll be opening our service, singing the church's one foundation, number 644. I've got a children's message today, and so we're going to sing the first three stanzas, and during that third stanza, um, if the children could please come forward, you can sit on the floor or on the pew there, and I have a message for you, and then we'll finish with the last two stanzas after the message. Sometimes if you go to a Rams game, maybe you'll wear something that you know shows that you support the Rams, that you like the Rams. Or if you go to an Orchard Farm Eagles football game, we wear green. If you go to a Lutheran High game, we wear blue. You know, we always wear 
clothes oftentimes that say something about who we are there for, why we are there. And, and that's true too when we come to worship. And especially for Mr. Eaton and I, as we come out here, we are dressed in a very special way to teach you something about the Bible and the truth of God's promise and love for his saints. There's a Bible passage you're going to hear in just a little bit from Revelation chapter 7 that says that there will be all of these people from every tribe and every nation who are going to be before God, every language, and they will be dressed in white robes. And the white robes that we, Mr. Heaton and I, are wearing are reminders of that. And the reason they are white, and the Bible tells us, is because they have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, it says. That's just a way of saying, I don't know if in heaven we're really going to be wearing robes or not, but it is a way of saying that we have been forgiven because of Jesus' blood shed on the cross. Because Jesus died for you and for me, but he was raised again and lives in heaven so that we can be with him there and we will be without sin. Well, I'm wearing something here, and I want you to, to remember a couple things here. These are th three different things here. Well, four with the cross. This under here, this black part, is called a cassock. Can you say cassock? Good, good. And this is called a surplus. Say surplus. surplus. Not a surplus, but a surplus. Mm -hmm. And this and this is something that teaches us something. Now, the black cassock underneath is saying that I am a sinful person, just like we are all sinful people, and that black reminds us of our sin. And yet we are covered with the robes that have been washed clean by the blood of Christ. And so this white robe, this surplus, is a reminder that I have been covered and forgiven in Jesus. Now, Mr. Heaton doesn't have the black part, and so that's a good picture of how we will be totally without sin in heaven. But right now, you and I are saints, but we are also sinners, aren't we? Is there anything that you ever done that you knew that was wrong, that, that you know, that that made God sad, that made Jesus sad because of some sin that you had done, something that you had said, something that you had done to somebody, something you would even thought. We are all sinners in this world. And so as long as we're here, we're still sinful people, but we have still been covered with God's forgiveness. And that's why I wear a cassock and a surplus to remind us of that simple truth, that we are at the same time sinners and saints, saints and sinners, because God has forgiven our sins in Jesus. If you can go back to your seat, we'll sing the last two verses of our hymn. <laughs> Saints Day comes from Revelation chapter 7. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, 
Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in, their in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Alleluia. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Alleluia. St. Matthew in the fifth chapter. Glory Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ, dear saints. You know, this reading from Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, it's a common reading. We use it at various times throughout our three year cycle. And every time we read it, I'm always reminded of a bumper sticker I once saw that simply said, the meek don't want it. I thought that was really funny because I, when I realized that this was a, a play on the, the third of the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And this is saying the meek don't want it. When you look around at this world around us, who wants to inherit that? And yet we know 
from the, the first and the second Beatitudes that talk about inheriting the kingdom of heaven. And then, then when we talk about inheriting the earth now, we're talking about not the earth as it is today, but that restored creation, that beautiful Eden-like creation that God had intended for us from the very beginning. That's what we will inherit for the meek, those who are not pushing their way, not forcing their way, but offering the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ in a, in a loving way. This is what the, the Beatitudes are all about. It's all about preparing us now for what's happening to happen later in heaven, for the blessings that we will receive there. It is encouragement to us. And Jesus was at a point of full disclosure here. He wasn't trying to paint over anything. He was making it very clear that if you're going to follow him, it's not going to be easy, but it will be blessed. And I say that often at funeral times. This is not an easy time, but it will be a blessed time. There is a blessing, I think, in the Beatitudes that, that people don't necessarily want. Maybe that's a misnomer. Maybe the, the title that I, I've given this sermon, The Blessing No One Wants, is kind of a, a misleading title. It implies somehow that, that we don't want to be received into the kingdom of heaven, that we don't want the great reward that's there? Well, that's absurd. That's, that's foolishness. Of course we want to be received into God's kingdom. And of course we want that reward, whatever it may be. We don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we know that if Jesus promised it, it is going to be great. And so we want it. What we don't necessarily want is what leads up to that in the 8th and the ninth Beatitudes when he says, blessed are the persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And then says, blessed are you when you are persecuted, when you are reviled, when you are persecuted, when, when there is all kinds of evil sayings spoken falsely against you on account of me. Blessed are you. No one wants to be treated that way. But there is a, pos a positive purpose for any of the persecution, any of the difficulties that we may face or that the church has faced throughout the ages. See, there are many times and many places where the church has thrived under intense persecution, reviled. That means to be the subject of, of threatening taunts, vile, violent, abusive language, to be persecuted, to, be, to, to, to inflict injury on someone either physically or mentally and emotionally, to be lied about, to, have, to be accused of being bigoted, being hateful, being narrow-minded, all of those things that we oftentimes hear cast against us as Christians these days whenever we speak the truth in love. At the same time, what I've found in, as I look through the history of the church, that there are times when the church has languished in luxury and it has weakened during those times. Too much prosperity can be a problem. Another purpose, though, of the pain of persecution is that it gives us a signal that we are on the right path. It gives us an idea of where we're going and what we're doing. This is what Jesus says, and it says that such it was with the, the prophets who were before you. If you are suffering in the same way for the same reason as the prophets, you are in good company. You are on the right path. It's not meaning that we should be abrasive or abusive ourselves, but if we are speaking the truth in love and people are... are rankled against that, then we are on the right path. Not an easy way, but a blessed way. There's a man, his name is Dr. Paul Brand, who teamed up with Philip Yancey to write a book titled The Gift That No One Wants. 
He tells a story in the first chapter of a, a, a young girl, 11-year-old girl named Tanya, who was living right here in St. Louis in an institution. Tanya was a double amputee. She had no legs. Most of her fingers were missing. Her tongue was filled with cuts and lacerations from her chewing on it. Seven years before this, when she was four years old, her parents had brought her to Dr. Brand because they had known that he had worked with people who were leprous and they had heard that, that this may be a symptom of leprosy. It, it, as it turns out, it was, and what she had was a very rare disease that, that deadened her nerves so much that she could feel no pain. And so when she was four years old and they brought her to him, her one ankle just turned freely because it was dislocated. Her other foot was, the bone was protruding out of it because it had been damaged so much and she didn't care. She didn't even realize that that was the case. She would hurt herself and, and, and not worry about it. In fact, she learned to kind of like it. There was a little bit of a tingle that, that, that she enjoyed when she felt something that we would normally be screaming out in pain about, but she kind of enjoyed the tingle. She also learned that her horrified parents would sometimes try to set her straight, to set boundaries, to try to teach her, try to discipline her, and as soon as they would try that, she would start to put her gnawed fingers to her mouth and start to chew, and they would stop immediately. It wasn't long before her father left her mother because he couldn't take it any longer. And so this idea of the absence of pain for this little girl left her in a place where she not only was abusing herself, but it was also breaking down relationships with people all around her. And Paul Brand said that if he could give her or people who with, were diagnosed with leprosy and many diabetics and people who, who with, with multiple sclerosis, if he could give them any gift, he would give them the gift of pain. And eventually, he renamed his book, The Gift of Pain. The gift that no one wants. It's an important part of life. It, it gives us a signal. When we are moving towards something that is dangerous or harmful, we feel that pain and hopefully will back off. Unfortunately, when we talk about sin, you know and I know people who for one reason or another are not feeling the pain. Perhaps it's because they have indulged in that sin so many times that they don't even recognize any kind of sense of remorse or repentance over, no contrition, no sorrow for what they've said or done. There are people who have, because of drug abuse or alcohol abuse or, or, or because of some other kind of addiction, have numbed themselves to the pain and will continue to do that, not realizing how harmful it is to themselves, how it's, they, they set themselves up to be abused by other people, and how it even breaks down relationships between them and the people who truly care about them. They need the gift of pain. We need pain to send us a signal of what's dangerous. And too often, we try to avoid that. See, the problem is, is that the person who, whose opportunity, whose role, whose relationship gives them a chance to speak to that person, that's the person who's going to feel the pain when we are the one who needs to say something, who wants to say something, it's hard to do that because it might be a little painful for us. It might be a little hard. We're risking something there. We want to avoid those sacrifices because we're afraid that it'll break a relationship. Jesus never avoided the sacrifices. Jesus never avoided the pain. Right before the Beatitudes, Jesus went off into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, no food, nothing to drink. 
he suffered severe pain. And that was just preparation for everything that he would go through in the next three years. He would have few, if any, creature comforts. And he would warn the disciples whenever he asked them to follow him, whenever he asked, invited the, the disciples to believe in him, he would be... He would give full disclosure. This is not going to be easy. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head, and, and, and neither will you. It's, it's not an easy way to go, but it's blessed. Jesus would be reviled by the, prophet, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes and the, the religious leaders of the day. He would be persecuted. He would be arrested. He would be beaten. He would suffer the worst torment. He would have people saying all kinds of evil accusations and lying, lying against him about things that he never said or did in order to try to put him on a cross. And when he eventually was put on that cross, he didn't avoid the pain, even though he could have. And when he was abandoned on that cross from not only the people around him, the relationships were broken for a while, but also he was abandoned by his own father. He, he suffered pure hell on the cross for us. He would not avoid the pain, no matter what it might have been. And because of that, Jesus knows every ounce of pain and hardship that you or I could ever face. And having died on that cross, been raised again, now being ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, he is with us. He has that relationship in heaven with all the saints who are there and all of us who are here. And so if we want to be close to those people who are separated from us, then we want to be close to Jesus by coming to worship here. So that the people who are singing the, the praises that we hear in Re, uh, Revelation chapter 7 are singing with us. We are praying and singing those praises together when we sing. This is the feast. It's the very same words we're singing together. And it's a relationship that becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So I've got a question for you. Jesus never avoided this pain. He took it on voluntarily. How about our voluntary following of Christ? Prompted by the Holy Spirit, enabled by the Holy Spirit, but we can turn away. What's easier to do, to, to, to turn away from Christ because we could avoid some of that reviling and some of that persecution from other people? What is, what is more difficult than turning away from people that we love because we're afraid that it might break a relationship when really it's the very thing that is necessary to strengthen that relationship. It is a, an evidence of a sacrifice, a, a willing, voluntary sacrifice for the sake of that person and their love and their relationship with our Lord that will last for an eternity. What's easier? To voluntarily give up a little bit of time some extra money in the offering plate as we go through our stewardship campaign these few weeks and then throughout the year. You know, those are voluntary things. And when we set those against those other types of pain and suffering that people are, are threatened to endure, we, we can see that this is easy stuff compared to that. We're not ascetics. We're not trying to make ourselves suffer in such a way that we think somehow we're going to get God's attention on us. It doesn't work that way. But because of what Christ has suffered for us and he knows what all that we suffer, then we can also then sacrificially give of ourselves what we have, who we are to the church, to our community over and over again. And as we do, the purpose is to build relationships, relationships that will last for an eternity in heaven. I think the one prepares us for another. 
And so I want to encourage you again today, many of you filled out the sheets that, uh, that we put in the bulletins last week. Some of you weren't able to be here last week, and so I want to encourage you to fill those out today, to get outside of our comfort zone a little bit, to say, hey, I'm going to push myself a little bit in, in what I give of my time and my talents and my treasures, to look for some ways that I could serve the Lord here at Trinity. And I want you to fill those out during the offering. And what's going to happen then after our prayers, we'll take our offering, we'll receive our offerings first, and then the ushers will come right back down the line. And for anyone who had not filled one of these out, uh, you, can, you can pass those along. If you want to leave it blank, go ahead and leave it blank. I don't care. Um, just pass it along. And if you've, some of you may have rethought of what you put down last week, change it and put another one. You can have more than one. I, I don't care about that either. But as we do, we remember the promises that God gives to you and to me of a blessed life in heaven because of what he has accomplished for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. We rise to confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. Today we'll be remembering those who uh, are saints among us who are now saints with the Lord in heaven in this past year. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, as we observe this All Saints Day, we pray for the world in which we live. For you have made the heavens and the earth and everything in them, and our sin has corrupted your good world. And we ask that you would have mercy on us according to your pleasure and give wisdom to the leaders of the nations, especially those in authority in our own country, that they would make good and God-pleasing decisions. We pray for law enforcement personnel and those in the military who face danger and abuse daily so that we may worship you in safety and security. We especially pray for the well-being of Stephen, Eric, Tyler, Roger, Eric, Chance, and Zach. For the sake of your people, restrain those who want to riot and, the end, and end the madness of war. And above all, allow the good news of Jesus Christ to bring about the only peace that really lasts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O patient Father, have mercy on this world where so many are lost and separated from you. We are aware of the reviling and the persecution and the abuse of lying that Christians are being subjected to every day in our own nation and throughout the world. Lord of glory. It is not your will that any should be lost, but rather that all people would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so send out your Holy Spirit to enlighten the hearts of the rebels and the wanderers, demolish the strongholds of Satan's deceptions, and set the prisoners free through faith in the finished work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, when you were on earth, men mocked and abused you, and yet you did not retaliate. You blessed those who cursed you. Grant us the same grace, enabling us to give a gentle answer even when we are reviled, persecuted, and the target of evil lies, so that wrath can be turned away and your name be honored in everything. We pray for our pastors and missionaries, including Tim. Grant us strength and to persevere until that day when we will receive our reward in heaven. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, you invite us to call upon you in the day of trouble. Hear us as we pray for those who are sick or suffering especially the cancer survivors, Daryl, Connie, Trish, Eric, Ruth, Zachary, Jeannie, Gail, Tom, Sam, Jackie, Rowan, Bob, Tom, Ed, Bob, Carla, and Rosiva, and those receiving other types of treatment, Ramona, Merlin, Bill, Amanda, Ruth, Francis, Noel, Jean, Jerry, Jim, Andre, Jenny, Pat, Bob, Edgar, Don, Ruth, Phyllis, Evelyn, Bill, Pat, May, Lois, Chris, Diane, and Janet, 
And for the children, Nathan, Harper, Hayden, Wayne, Catherine, Anya, Nicholas, and Izzy, comfort them in their time of trial. Meet them in their need, and according to your pleasure, bless them. Grant them healing and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who grieve. Heavenly Father, the spirits of everyone who have departed in the faith are with you. And in your presence there is no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And so today we remember the family and friends of, of Mabel Berry. Comfort those who mourn with them. Certainly that you will come with the truth that you will come again to gather all your faithful together at the end of all things. And remind us in the midst of our sorrow that the, the marriage feast of the Lamb and the joyful reunion with those we love is coming soon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In joyful expectation of the resurrection to eternal life, we remember before our Lord our departed family and friends who have gone before us in the faith and all who are in our hearts and our minds this day. For Ruby Kisker, Esther Umbach, Jerry Umbach, D. Badiger, and Eileen Tubasin. Almighty God, we remember with thanksgiving those who loved and served you in your church and on earth who rest now from their labors. And so keep us in fellowship with all your saints and bring us at last to the joy of your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So as most of you know, we've been carrying on this Trinity tree, a part of our family tree, the different organizations that make up our congregation that we support as a congregation over uh, many, many years. And, and so we've le left uh, the ushers to the very end, and, and uh, I'm not saying the best for last, but I'm going to say they're important, and, and I, we want to, uh, I thought it was appropriate to have them speak on this service because we just are a week away from the uh, sausage supper that they're sponsoring and that we are all a part of. And so um, I want to invite uh, Tim Trudeau is going to come up. There's Tim, and he's going to share a few words with us. Thanks, Pastor. You're welcome. Good morning. One of my uh, fellow ushers asked me this morning, how long is your speech going to be? I said, well, the time Pastor, he was 16 minutes. I promise I'll be less than less than pastor, so I can go 15 minutes and still keep my promise. <laughs> uh, now, there, there are 28, currently there are 28 ushers who see us every Sunday. Uh, we participate in, in all of the uh, church calendar events. Uh, I don't know if you hear it uh, here at, at church and in any events that we do, you know, church picnic, things like that. So if you are interested in, in participating in the ushers, well, please contact either me or pastor. We'd love to have you. We're missing about five, six people now, we'll do the transfers, have a couple ushers just uh, kind of retire, if you will, so if you're interested, we, only, we meet twice a year, once in uh, August, we'll do a little fish fry uh, up at uh, school, and then we have a, a breakfast in January, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lighthearted group, so, so no, nobody has to work too hard, so, a um, couple of things, uh, seen us, we started this last year, the hog sponsorship, this is, uh, was uh, very helpful to our group in, in covering some of the costs of the sausage supper, uh, the, the yellow sheet, or the pink sheets this year are in the back, uh, if you haven't filled out one already, we're a little bit behind last year's pace, so if you haven't turned it in, please get them uh, either to me or to, or to Cindy, uh, give Cindy a chance, we can, we can get that tallied and, and accounted for, and, and last, I just want to thank the congregation, because the sausage supper, while it is sponsored by the ushers, would not exist uh, at all. We would not have success at all if it wasn't for the participation of all of you uh, in the congregation. And that's true of many of the functions that we do uh, or participate in. So again, our thanks uh, on behalf of the ushers for, for all your help uh, and your old time and treasure uh, with, with the sausage supper. And then lastly, you know, the sausage supper is a lighthearted uh, event. If you have folks that are, are interested in joining church or becoming, if you have friends or neighbors, uh, that, that are looking, are you considering introducing them to Trinity? I think Sausage Supper is a great time to do that. It's a, it's a very um, easy way to uh, mingle and meet people. And if you haven't signed up already, um, it, 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 it looks like the sheet's 
almost full. It's, a, it's, it, it's still, I would encourage you to come up and maybe pull it around. There's, there's always folks looking for backup. Uh, or if, if you haven't uh, participated yet, it's a good time to see maybe some areas that you'd like to, to sign up for next year. Um, and then lastly, Friday we are making sausage. So we'll start at 8 a.m. So if anyone if you can, if you can get, here, uh, get here by 8 a.m., we'll get started. But we'll, uh, we'll go until about lunch. And then, uh, then it's cleanup time and then cranberry salad. Uh, also, if anyone would like to help out on Friday as well, we can make the, uh, the world famous cranberry salad. So, again, on behalf of the ushers, thank you for, for all your help and support of the ushers. All right. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, it's a great time. So, please, uh, if you can make time for Friday as well as uh, Saturday morning, Sunday, th that would be great. I know you'll have a great time. And then, um, also, I just want to say thank you to the ushers because they're so successful with the, the sausage supper and the butcherings that happened uh, subsequent to that as well. And it's really a kind of a go-to group for us. Whenever there's something that we can't cover in our budget, um, the ushers club are always there to, to help us out with that. And I really appreciate that as well. Plus the service that they do here in the church service. That, that's the most important of all. So having said that, uh, we, we do want to encourage you to take some time now to extend God's peace to one another and to uh, greet people that you may not know and, and to uh, then continue to share that good news of God's love for us in Christ. Thank you.